OK. Well, uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Dajaha. Thank you for uh, joining our webinar today, where we will be speaking with Professor Reza Hazma. Uh, Reza is a full professor of political science here at the University of Alberta, a very close partner of the China Institutes. And uh, Reza will be unveiling and walking us through the results of our 2024 How China Sees the World survey. My name is Philip Rowe, and I am the director of the China Institute. Uh, before we get started, allow me to share uh, a couple of things and do a little bit of housekeeping. So first, I would like to note that the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory and respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Secondly, uh, just to give our viewers a, a sense of uh, how the event is going to unroll, uh, I will make a few uh, brief remarks and then turn things over to Reza, that will, who will walk us through the results of this uh, survey. And uh, at, at the end, we're going to try to leave uh, at least uh, 10 or 15 minutes for some uh, questions and answers. So we welcome uh, submissions of questions uh, during the course of the presentation, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, the event will, uh, will be recorded so that uh, uh, people who have not had a chance to uh, listen today can listen in the future. Or indeed, if uh, they were fascinated enough, I want to listen again at uh, some point uh, down the road. And uh, we're going to try to run this within 60 to 70 minutes uh, maximum. Um, perhaps as well, before we turn to the survey, maybe I'd like to share a quick word about uh, uh, the China, China Institute with our viewers. So the China Institute is the largest think tank and policy institute dedicated to the study of China and Canada. Uh, it uh, is independent thanks to a significant and visionary endowment uh, that uh, was given to the U of A 15 years ago by the McTaggart family and the uh, government of Alberta. Uh, our mandate is to help deepen understanding of China in Canada and, and, and also uh, around the world, and also try to chart paths for fruitful engagement between Canada and China, as well as examine global issues where more productive engagement with China is accretive to the global commons. And I think that from that perspective, certainly uh, today's topic fits very nicely. Uh, indeed, uh, as you'll see, the, the survey offers a fairly rare opportunity to garner insights into Chinese citizens' perceptions of international affairs and of the role can China should play therein. It also serves as a, a bit of a counterpoint to other regional attitudinal surveys, uh, that, thus offering clues as to which countries Chinese citizens view either as most relevant on the international scene or indeed as most desirable potential partners for China. Uh, it covers a lot of ground, and that means that to my mind, the survey will be of interest not only to scholars and researchers, but also to policymakers and interested members of the general public, helping everyone inform, to helping to inform an understanding of contemporary Chinese society as well as some of the internal drivers of its future foreign policy direction. So personally, I'm very excited by this opportunity to garner a rare glimpse into Chinese citizens' perceptions of some global issues and as, uh, get a better sense of their attitudes. Um, as I mentioned off the top, this survey has seen the light of day thanks to the leadership of Professor Reza Hazmath and also uh, thanks to a lot of support from our team here at the China Institute. Reza, uh, before uh, I turn things over to you, and before uh, we dive into some of the specifics of the survey's results, I wonder if uh, uh, off the top I can ask you to share with readers what was what was the thinking that motivated you to undertake this project uh, from the outset a couple of years ago? Well, I said thank you, welcome everyone, and, and thank you, Philip, for the question. Um, the motivations really try to gauge what citizens actually think. We tend not to know as much what citizens in China actually think, particularly non-urbanites, particularly those in the Western areas. So the idea really was to, you know, to gauge a greater understanding of the citizens' beliefs about other countries. Um, because often when we look at the media in our own countries, in our own jurisdictions, we get one glimpse of the reality. But so it's going to the horse's mouth, so to speak, is something that's super interesting and super important for us to actually understand. Okay, well, that's that's uh, that, that's great, and and you know, I'm sure many of our viewers already appreciate that it's it's not always easy to uh, conduct uh, survey work in the PRC, uh, and yet you've managed to garner this kind of rich uh, tapestry of results, uh, uh, which will be of uh, great interest, uh, especially right now, right in a in a context of emerging uh, 
great power rivalry and, and also uh, increased agency of various uh, middle powers and, and also some some rising actors within the kind of so-called global south environment as well. But were, were there are there any specific challenges to doing survey work in, survey work in China or methodological observations that, that are worth sharing uh, right off the top before we dive into the results? Well, yeah. Yeah, so this is something I'm going to talk a bit more um, as the survey as, as the presentation continues. But I think there are two things to note. One, it's always difficult to do survey research in China. Um, you need to be a trusted actor, it, and it takes a long time to, to gather that trust. So it, I've been doing work in China for two decades now, and even and in, in, in over that course of that time, I've been a trusted actor, so to speak, to understand the hidden rules for success. So from a methodological standpoint, it is difficult, but once you have that trust, it's easier in many respects. But from a much more nuanced standpoint, we have a harder time understanding the rural population, the hidden populations, the, um, you know, the Western regions of China. We have a harder time understanding their perspectives, their worldviews. Uh, and so I think this is one one of the reasons why we did a, both a telephone and a, 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 a online survey was for us to actually, you know, capture those audiences we normally don't capture in surveys of this kind in China or even elsewhere. So it was it was important for us to actually capture those those perspectives, and they're reflected in the results that we have. That's a much richer, more statistically valid, demographically representative sample that we have. Well, that's great. And and uh, finally, before we dive in here, uh, one of the reasons I, I think that this year's uh, survey is particularly exciting. Uh, is is that it's the second one, and so uh, it allows us maybe to observe uh, a few uh, new or emerging trends uh, as we compare to the data from last year. Uh, I'm sure that as as we as you walk us through the results, uh, you can point to some of those. But at the at a very macro level, do you see any any emerging trends that uh, that are worth noting right off the top here? You know? um, well, I mean, I will note many of them throughout the the presentation, but there's two things I can think of the top of my head. First is Russia. Uh, there's been a lot of internal conversations within the Institute and among scholars about the role of Russia's uh, plays in, in, in the survey as well as uh, in everyday life. But um, akin to last year, we see Russia being very prominent in many of the indices that we're looking at. Uh, the second one is this year we actually asked how a lot of Chinese, how Chinese citizens think about their own country in many questions, which we didn't do last year. And lo and behold, I'll give you a great example. Last year, the United States was seen as the most uh, uh, important, the most influential actor. This year, when we actually put China into the fold, lo mm -hmm. and behold, China is seen as the most influential actor. So there's greater nuances as we continue uh, the survey this year and into the future years so that we're going to start seeing these emerging trends. But uh, definitely, there seems to be a rise of, of, of uh, Chinese nationalism, shall we say, or, or or just being you know proud of one's own country, which is it's just kind of uh, something that you, you think any jurisdiction would have, but it's quite pronounced in the data that we have. Yeah, it might actually be a function as well of... Uh of of uh, the three or four years of isolation during during covid and and the 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 force of the internal propaganda during those years starting to bear fruit or 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 perhaps being uh, perceivable now in terms of the survey work you're doing and so, certainly certainly yeah okay well look uh, i i just wanted to help set the stage and provide a bit of uh, uh, overarching context for our viewers but uh, but uh, i don't want to take a have too much time, so why don't I? I'm, I think we're all in your hands, Reza, as you walk us through the okay. results, and uh, we look forward to to hearing your observations. So over to you. So bear with me while I share my screen. Um, let me start here. Okay, so well, well, before I even start the presentation in a much more formal way, let me thank Philippe and the and the Institute, the China Institute, for being so supportive, both in terms of resources, in terms of. Uh, the, the policy research assistance in terms of the communications and design people. Um, this is not possible without them. This this certainly could not be accomplished without them. And as, I, as, as Philippe mentioned, this is the second year we've done this and um, such a great team to have to be able to, to develop this sort of um, report, shall we say. Um, so, you know, kind of the things we were hinting at um, in, in this report is trying to understand, um, you know, how China sees the world and why it's important in, to understand how they see the world. Um, it's it's without hyperbole to suggest that China's relationship with, with Western jurisdictions have really suffered from greater bidirectional tensions in the last year. Um, we see China's increasing support of Russia during the conflict with Ukraine, its ongoing trade disputes with the United States and European Union, 
uh, disputes in the South China Sea. It's reliant on dual use technologies to promote economic and military advancements. These have all played a role in creating this sort of tensions in the last year and, and crystallizing even further as, um, you know, as Xi Jinping's in Europe right now, for example, we, we see this sort of conversations about decoupling and de-risking from China. Um, so as China's rise as this sort of major world power marks this sort of feature of contemporary um, political, economic, and security realities, it's it really is important for us to understand citizens' perception of foreign jurisdictions and issues of global concern. Put differently, um, while the, the Communist Party of China has a monopoly over the political system, it does require popular support and legitimacy for its public policies and conduct. Um, and, and we can see that insofar the CPC does emphasize monitoring public opinion and conducting public opinion analysis to understand what citizens think. So it, it, it behoves us to actually understand and, and, and analyze what the general public's support or dissatisfaction are towards China's foreign policy and, 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 and the way they perceive the world. Simply put, the CPC and the state itself um, does that. And so it's important for us as in Western jurisdictions to understand how citizens think about these ideas. Um, and so before I, I give you the sort of result of what, what the survey finds, I'll, I'll say a few methodological notes. Um, Really, this is the second iteration of the uh, Citizens Global Perception Survey. Uh, as we hinted earlier onwards, this is an online and telephone national survey conducted in the first quarter of 2024. Um, what, uh, what was utilized was stratified and random sampling approach. Um, so it's a demographically representative and statistically valid sort of uh, survey, looking at how citizens view other nations and their relationships with China. Um, in particular, it was looking at Australia, Canada, the EU, France, Germany, India, Japan, Russia, the UK, and the US. Um, the survey had 33 questions and involved seven point Likert scale questions. Of course, the elephant in the room is, well, how valid is, are these results? How do we know citizens actually are, are saying what they really think? Um, and this is something that uh, is true for any survey uh, in any jurisdiction, but um, there's some equals, equally so in, in the Chinese context, there might be a, uh, a greater skepticism, shall we say, about whether or not uh, survey results can actually reflect citizens' perceptions. Um, one way we can measure this um, is looking at how long it takes a citizen or a respondent to actually answer the questions. So we can see if they're thinking about it, if they're if they're analyzing and, and thinking about the questions. And um, because a lot of this of the sample was online, we can actually tell um, how long they take. So um, using sort of an analysis in that respect, we could say that there's some sort of validity in their responses. And of course, we can also ask questions um, in, in, in a myriad of ways and, 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 and try and compare to other questions to see if there's correlations there. And again, we're just using those kinds of sort of academic techniques. We can say this is a rigorous sort of representative sort of sample of responses. Um, of course, in Q&As, I'll be happy to give you a bit more conversations about the methodological approaches here. But uh, for the most part, akin to last year's iteration, um, this is a, it's a great sample size and it's a, it's a very accurate sample size of, of responses. So what I thought I'll do is, in, in giving the uh, sort of findings, I'll focus on looking at a few things. I'll look at Chinese citizens' general global perception. I'll look at China's global roles, how citizens believe China's global roles should be. I'll look at uh, citizens' perception on foreign tourism, study, work, and immigration. Uh, I'll say a few words about Canada-China relations. And finally, I'll say a few words about Chinese citizens' sources and knowledge of global jurisdictions. So let's first start off by looking at general global perception. So Chinese citizens strongly indicated that China was the world's most powerful nation, with 67% of respondents rating it as the nation of the most influence on the global stage. Now, as I kind of mentioned beforehand, uh, in our last iteration, we didn't actually put China in as, as, a, as a sort of a response uh, sort of option. And so uh, last year's uh, iteration, uh, the United States was the most influential global jurisdiction. Um, in this year's, because we did put China into the fold as a, as a response option, the United States is now second. So you see here, um, there's a, you know, you, you see Chinese citizens believe that, and this should not be surprising to anyone in this room, that the United States and China are the two most powerful nations in the world, with China having that edge uh, by 4% here. What's fascinating is Russia. So Russia is seen as the third most influential global power. Um, and this is akin to last year's uh, iteration as well. 
And this is followed by the European Union. Now, in sharp contrast, we see 1% of respondents believe that Australia is an influential jurisdiction. Um, we see in Canada, we have 2%. Uh, so just uh, Canada slightly beat off uh, Australia in that respect there. Um, and so we do see that uh, this is sort of a scaling of how who has the most global uh, influence, shall we say. Um, the Australian one's a bit surprising um, because, you know, Australia, from an objective standpoint, um, is within many intelligence alliances, including the Five Eyes um, Alliance. They're in AUKUS, for example. They have a they have a very strong leadership role in, in the Asia in the Asia Pacific region and particularly in Oceania. Um, when we look at Canada, we see that Chinese citizens perceive Canada as holding a marginal position of influence within the international community. Um, if we look at aggregated scores below four, um, we see 30% of respondents view Canada as holding limited or, 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 or little influence. Uh, perhaps I can set this up, um, given this is the first sort of chart that I'm showing you. Uh, it's a Likert scale from one to seven. So four is considered neutral, one is considered least, seven is considered the most. So basically anything below four is considered least. Um, we usually aggregate the scores that way. Anything above four is considered most, and we aggregate the scores that way. Again, four is neutral. Um, and so generally speaking, when, when I continue with the charts, as for example, I'm looking at trust in global partners, um, we see that uh, uh, that sort of similar trend here, where, where, where um, despite the, the sort of continuation of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, Chinese citizens continue to perceive Russia as its most trusted global partner status it held in 2023 as well. Um, we see 81% of respondents express high levels of trust defined as an aggregate score above four with Moscow. And, and this trend is particularly apparent among highly educated, high income respondents, older age cohorts, and self-identified CPC members. Um, so in, despite these high levels of trust, it's quite notable that respondents' opinions on Russia appeared more divided in 2024 than in 2023. There's a slight variance of 1.96 and 1.85, respectively, suggesting a lack of, well, a, a, a reduced unity in citizens' views towards their bordering neighbor. Um, in contrast, both Japan and the United States had the least levels of trustworthiness. Now, why is trust so important? Well, in order for a state to engage with each other, you need to have minimum levels of trust to actually engage with each other. So that's why it's super important for us to understand who do citizens in China trust? So if they trust Russia the most, it would surmise that they have a greater uh, ability or greater chances or greater opportunities to actually engage with Russia. If they trust the United States the least, it suggests that this is, could be a barrier to cooperation. Um, in fact, when we look at CPC members, high income earners, and highly educated respondents, they were more likely to express higher trust in the United States, indicating a potential division within the Chinese public along socioeconomic lines and political affinities. Um, trust is something I'm gonna come back to. We're gonna look at knowledge and trust and how that sort of relationship in a future slide. Let me move on to the next sort of uh, question that we asked. We try to ask, uh, we ask this question, um, who has the most long-term importance to China? So who's the most uh, long-term sort of partner for China in the next decade? Uh, so by, by long-term, I mean the, within a decade. Uh, and what we see here is that 75% uh, of citizens rated China's ties with Russia as an important foreign relationship. This trend is even more pronounced uh, among highly educated high uh, income respondents and members of the CPC. Um, interestingly enough, the United States was closely behind with 68% of respondents rating it as China's most important relationship for its long-term future. Um, so when we look at the Canadian uh, sort of case, perceptions towards Canada's relationship with China appear slightly more balanced with only 44% of respondents viewing the relationship as somewhat or highly important. So aggregated scores below four. Um, shouldn't be surprising for those in the room that Japan has the lowest levels of endorsement, the lowest uh, is seen as the least important actor to China, given the history of, 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 uh, of Sino-Japanese relationships. Um, you know, it's not surprising to see that citizens believe China, uh, that Japan, uh, is, is, is not necessarily a, an important actor to China's long-term future. Um, as I turn to the next slide, this is a question where we ask citizens, who do you think is going to be the actor most likely to have a military conflict in the next decade? 
Um, interestingly enough, Russia and France um, is viewed as the most unlikely actor to engage in a military conflict. Russia, I'm going to speak to you about in, in, in later slides about, you know, how do we explain Russia? France is interesting, particularly as Xi Jinping, as I mentioned, is in, is in, was just in visiting France earlier this week, well, yesterday. Um, you know, France is seen as an actor that uh, um, has is perhaps one of the closest relationships to the EU to China. And citizens have picked up on the idea that France is a good actor, it's a good player, uh, uh, and it's a good friend to China in many respects. Um, and so, interestingly, despite growing political tensions and, and, and ongoing border disputes, 50% of respondents uh, score below four, believe a conflict with China and India is unlikely. Um, so, you know, it, we do see a, a mixed bag here in terms of the realities on the ground. And so far, India and China have had uh, numerous spats, numerous border disputes, yet citizens don't see it as a, uh, as a conflict um, uh, sort of an, uh, player in the next decade, shall we say. Um, well, given U.S.-China tensions in the 2020s, it shouldn't be surprising that the gross majority of respondents, two-thirds of respondents, actually viewed a conflict between China and the United States as inevitable. Um, and these findings cut across education levels, income levels. Um, and, and so res respondents rated the possibility of conflict with other jurisdictions as unlikely. But the United States is seen as an entity where there's a, there is a few flashpoints that might potentially harbor into a military conflict in the next decade. Um, so let's turn our page now to understand what citizens think um, areas China should take an active global role in. Um, ironically, having this conversation about the military conflict, um, you know, when we when when we did query respondents um, about this sort of question, um, respondents desired China to assume an active leadership role uh, in peacekeeping. Ninety five percent reported uh, a score above four. Now, this is kind of interesting because Western jurisdictions these days have a less of an appetite to engage in global peacekeeping missions, Canada included. And here, maybe um, the citizens see China can, you know, take in, you know, that sort of vacuum to actually enter that vacuum in peacekeeping missions. In other words, citizens want China to take up the mantle and assume stewardship of global security in the developing world. Um, the strategy also has the added benefit of challenging or at the very least influencing uh, global institutional action and can be favorable to many Chinese who see global institutions as Western dominated. So peacekeeping is the most important issue for Chinese global leadership. This is followed by technology. Um, and, and it's interesting because technology has been the sort of area in which, uh, if you look at the last five-year plan, um, the potentially the new upcoming plan, it's quite technologically and innovative, um, innovation, technological innovation uh, heavy. In, in terms of investments. And it seems that citizens do support the parties push into on, on having China have a technological leadership role. Um, and so there is a lot of convergence in that respect. Now, of course, one of the, the biggest questions that's been, that's been talked about among Western jurisdictions is whether or not uh, we should decouple with China, should we de-risk from China? So we, we, we ask Chinese citizens, well, what do you think? Should China limit or expand cooperation? And for the majority of Western jurisdictions, um, we see the proliferation of policies aiming at reducing Chinese involvement in supply and value chains, public and private organizations, extractive industries. Um, in spite of all that rhetoric in the West, um, we see that the citizens in China are not necessarily pro or anti-decoupling, um, but they generally have a, a preference for expanding global economic cooperation. And they generally have an, a preference for, for expanding technological and research collaboration. Um, in fact, um, one third of respondents indicated that China should strongly expand its economic ties with Russia, which is interesting because that's the opposite messaging that Western jurisdictions are trying to give to China, that China should have less of a tie to Russia, particularly in the background of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, and this is very consistent. Last year, we saw a very similar reality whereby um, in the last iteration of the survey, we saw citizens wanted uh, China to strongly expand economic ties with Russia. Um, and if you dig a bit deeper, uh, we see that um, those who are supporting expansion of economic ties with Russia tends to be those in China's, uh, tends to be China's elites. Uh, those, those residing in urban settings, 
those with higher levels of education. These are the individuals who wants China to actually expand its economic relationship with, with, with Russia. And it kind of makes sense from a strategic standpoint. When, when you see Western jurisdictions um, you know, removing itself from Russian markets, it, it creates a, a vacuum for you know, the Chinese to actually enter. So it's a great opportunistic sort of uh, um, potential for Chinese businesses and enterprises to, to enter the Russian space or to, to develop even further in the Russian space. So it, 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 from that standpoint, we do see that uh, um, China's elites do see the, the, the potential opportunity for Russia as, and, and, and they're supportive of, 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 of China expanding its economic ties into the nation. Um, in terms of citizens' view whether or not to limit or, or expand cooperation with Canada, it remains virtually unchanged from the previous year. In 2024, 55% of respondents indicated that China should somewhat or greatly expand its economic cooperation with Canada, while in 2023 it was 56%. So it's a very similar level. We're not really moving the needle uh, in terms of the worldview of Chinese and whether or not they should expand or limit cooperation with, with Canada. Um, now, where it becomes a bit more contentious is collaboration on technology and research, at least contentious on our end in terms of the Western jurisdictions. Um, so despite, you know, the sort of uh, tensions or regulatory actions in many Western jurisdictions, respondents exhibit a generally positive disposition towards the United States when queried about the extent to which China should limit or encourage collaboration in high tech and research fields in the United States. With 63% of respondents expressing an interest in, in uh, expanding technological cooperation with the United States. Um, in terms of the Canadian context, Canada's standing in research and, and, and technological collaboration with China remain relatively unchanged. So again, we're not moving the needle either in economic cooperation or in high tech and research sectors. Um, well, what are citizens' attitudes towards China's global engagement? So um, in this iteration, we asked respondents to rate their agreeableness between uh, one and seven, so strongly disagree and strongly agree, with a series of seven statements on Chinese foreign affairs and global relationships. So uh, I'll read the seven statements, and you can see it at the bottom of the slide there. Uh, China should concentrate more on domestic affairs than on global matters. China is currently too open to foreign influence and thinking. The more a nation cooperates with China, the better off those nations will be. Uh, China's relationship with Western nations will be more competitive rather than cooperative in the next decade. China's political and economic model should be exported to other nations. China should change international practices and laws to reflect Chinese norms and values. China should increase its global military presence in order to further improve its national security. It was that last statement which we saw citizens actually reacting most vehemently towards, whereby there's a greater agreeableness um, where uh, that China should expand its global military presence to bolster national security. So 68% of respondents um, with an aggregated score above four expresses general agreement. Um, and this was an opinion held across education, income levels, highlighting citizens' sort of consensus on the need to expand the, the People's Liberation Army's global footprint. Um, and interestingly enough, in, in the current budget, in this, in this annual budget, uh, we do see China's increasing its military spending by 7%. And so it, there's a sort of a interesting sort of correlation there between citizens' um, expectation that the state should, um, you know, have a greater global military presence and, and military spending. Um, consistent with previous years, the possibility of China exporting its political and economic model abroad garnered the least support among respondents, only a third really expressing their disagreement towards this. Um, albeit this, the statement appears to be uh, most popular among high income earners and self-identified CPC members, suggesting a discrepancy between elite level and public opinions. Um, I'll turn my attention now to looking at future global interactions in the next decade, particularly tourism, study, work, and immigration preferences. And in doing so, I'm going to show you four very simple graphs that, that, that kind of paint the picture of where we're at in terms of where citizens want to have tourism, where is their destination of choice for studying and working abroad, where they potentially want to emigrate to. Um, in terms of tourism, France, renowned as the world's most visited country, continues to attract significant interest in China, with 15% of respondents expressing a desire to visit as their top-ranked locale. Second is Russia. Um, and we'll have a conversation about Russia there again. Um, the UK is the third most desired destination, 
Um, Canada does not place very highly here. Um, uh, well, compared to the top three anyways. But Canada is at 11%, which is, um, uh, I guess it's akin to Germany and akin to uh, um, uh, Japan as well. So we're, we're, we're not in the top perhaps, but uh, it's still, you know, relatively speaking, um, doing much better than India, shall we say, or better than Australia. In terms of studying abroad, um, I know there's a lot of uh, interest in, in terms of where students' preferences are, Chinese citizens' preferences are to study abroad, particularly since those patterns are shifting. When we ask this question, where do you want to study abroad in the next decade? Um, United Kingdom was the top choice among 20% of respondents. This marks a significant shift in the last iteration of the survey, which last year's survey, where the UK garnered interest from only 16% of respondents. Um, we see the United States slipping in, in, in 2024 into sixth place, garnering support from only 9% of respondents. Um, last year, it was 20% of respondents. So we see there's a, um, you know, this, this could potentially be because there's there's been greater scrutiny of Chinese students at U.S. ports of entry. Um, there might be potential barring Chinese students with suspected ties to the PLA. So th this is actually, these kinds of news, these kinds of um, attitudes is, 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 and these kinds of reality is, 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 is actually influencing behavior in many respects, or at least stated behavior of where to study next. Um, in terms of working abroad, uh, we see Russia, we see Germany commanding um, a preferred working destination. Um, in terms of immigration preferences, um, we see that uh, a considerable portion of respondents express an openness to immigration opportunities abroad, with Canada remaining a popular immigration destination with 23% of total responses, and that's up by 12% last year. Um, perhaps uh, because we've had, uh, um, in the last few years, a much more liberal sort of migration policy, um, I think that that has trickled down into uh, uh, citizens thinking it could potentially, Canada could potentially be a, a good popular destination of choice. Um, we've seen Russia's popularity as a as a place to emigrate has declined significantly relative to last year, um, and it only ranks ahead now of India and Japan in terms of desirability. Um, so let's let's talk about Canada and China relations a bit more now. Uh, we 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 asked a series of questions specifically looking at Canada-China relations in terms of economic cooperation, environmental cooperation, uh, cultural exchanges, global governance. So let me say a few words about each of those categories there. So this, you know, it's interesting because when you look at the Canada-China relationship, it dates back, or at least the contemporary relationship, dates back to 1970, where Canada was one of the first Western jurisdictions to recognize the PRC. Um, and it's been relatively positive in the four decades following normalization, and it kind of deteriorated in 2018 uh, with the, with the um, uh, Hmong and the Two Michaels saga, uh, and, and diplomatic relations last year was dominated by high-profile spats over Chinese high-altitude balloons violating Canadian and U.S. airspace and allegations of, of election interference. Um, and so it did lead to reciprocal expulsions of diplomats and the launch of a public inquiry on election interference by foreign actors, including China. And that remains ongoing. Um, so that's a sort of background here when we're having this conversation of, you know, should you know, should we expand or should, should should China expand economic cooperation, environmental cooperation and the like? Um, in terms of economic cooperation, the number of response open to greater economic cooperation remain high in 2024, with nearly 75% indicating a general willingness, this was an aggregated score of above four, to expand economic cooperation. This is quite a, apparent, this trend, with higher educated respondents, those residing in urban areas, and CPC members. Um, the results also, you know, it's quite comparable, comparably favorable in the last iteration last year, where 65% of respondents welcome and increase economic cooperation. So despite, you know, the sort of highly publicized spats between Canada and China, citizens do want um, Canada and China to expand economic cooperation. Um, when it comes to environmental cooperation, 71% um, of respondents gave an above neutral score, above four, compared with 64% in 2023. So there's been an increase of 7%. Um, when it looks like cultural exchanges, the data suggests that the public support for, for, for cultural exchanges with Canada remains strong. 79% of respondents indicated support for cooperation on this front compared to 72 last year. So again, in spite of our, our spats, our highly publicized spats, 
um, uh, citizens do, do see greater economic cooperation, environmental cooperation, cultural exchanges as something that they do prefer. And it's actually increasing relative to last year. Um, when we look at global governance and, and global security cooperation, uh, support for cooperation and global governance increased by 7%, um, or I guess six and six and a half around there. Um, so last year was, uh, this year was 73% supported global governance cooperation. Uh, last year was 67% approximately. We also see uh, um, citizen support for cooperation with Canada pertaining to global security issues remains quite high. And nearly 80% of respondents have firmly supported the stance. So there's an appetite, there's a strong appetite among the citizenry to, to cooperate with Canada on global governance issues and global security uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, issues as well. Now, what are the main factors influencing Canada-China relations? Um, interestingly enough, last year, we, we, it was quite apparent from, from responses um, that citizens were not very knowledgeable about Canada. And so in light of this, uh, we directly asked participants whether or not they felt the Canadian public was knowledgeable about China. Um, and what the findings show is that nearly half of respondents, about 46% of respondents, um, somewhat or strongly disagree that the Canadian public has a strong understanding of China, while only one third of respondents express uncertainty on the subject. Only a minority of, of respondents perceive the Canadian public as having a comprehensive understanding of China. Um, this is a view that's concentrated among highly educated, high income and urban residents. In other words, if I was to put this in a different way, um, it seems that uh, um, Chinese citizens believe Can Canadians don't really understand China. Um, that's what the data is telling us. Um, and it might be a reciprocal relationship whereby um, perhaps the Chinese public doesn't understand Canada as well. Um, and so what we do see is that uh, there has to be greater public relations, public affairs kinds of push towards um, um, promoting Canada in China, perhaps, uh, to, 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 to have a much more healthier relationship. And, and what I mean by that, and I'll show you in a, in a later slide, there's a strong relationship between knowledge of a, of a jurisdiction and trust in a jurisdiction. Except for the United States, all other jurisdictions, we see have a strong correlation where if a citizen believes they have knowledge about the country, they're more likely to trust the country, save for the United States, of course. Um, another question we asked was, um, you know, we, we asked citizens about the factors they perceive as having the greatest impact on Canada-China relations. So we, we gave them four options. One, China's growing international power, Canada's relationship with the United States, differences in values between Canada and China, Canada's domestic politics and policy environments. Um, the largest respondents thought was the idea that China's growing international power was the major factor influencing Canada-China relationship. 82% somewhat or strongly agreed. So it's particularly evident among self-identified CPC members, mid-tier professionals, and urban residents. Um, the second highest rated factor was Canada's relationship with the United States. The, one of the least uh, or the lowest rated factor was differences in values between Canada and China as a barrier to cooperation. And I think that's super interesting to note because if there's a variance in values, if people perceive that your values are much different than, than my own, um, they're less likely to cooperate. And so at least from that level, citizens in, Can in China do not see that values between Canada and China are significantly different. And at the very least does not uh, um, forge a barrier to cooperation. Um, so let's talk about sources and knowledge of global jurisdictions. As I hinted beforehand, there's a strong correlation between knowledge of a jurisdiction and trust in a jurisdiction. The jurisdiction, most respondents felt that they were knowledgeable was the United States, Japan, and Russia. Respondents were less likely to be knowledgeable of Australia and Canada. And you could see the, the old audits there, the jurisdiction familiarity there, um, reinforcing that sort of relationship. Um, in other words, both Australia and Canada needs to do a better job in, 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 in sort of educating the general public in China about Canada and what we can offer and what both entities can offer uh, China, the Chinese public, shall we say. Um, where do citizens get information? Well, it's again akin to all jurisdictions. It's well, most jurisdictions. Uh, it seems that social media is the most common way to obtain information on global affairs. And we see that across all demographic categories, whether it's age, education, residential location, employment status. 
Um, this is fascinating because um, traditional traditional media, if you're looking at television, radio, uh, newspapers, it's much easier to censor. It's much more easier to control if you're the party. Social media, although there are levers to censor, there are levers to control it, it's much more difficult relative to traditional media. So from an analytical standpoint, it does raise questions about the ability of the state to directly influence and shape perceptions of foreign actors and behavior. And this becomes evident when I talk about uh, how citizens think about Taiwan and whether or not Taiwan and China should unify, how citizens think about the Israeli-Palestine conflict, which I'll talk about in a moment, and how citizens think about um, uh, the Ukraine and, 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 and Russia conflict, where we see um, a variance between social media, people who get information through social media versus getting information on traditional media. So here are these, uh, first one, as I mentioned, was notable findings about the Russia. Let's talk about Russia for a moment, then I'll talk about uh, Ukraine. Uh, I'll talk about Palestine, and then we'll, we'll, we'll end the presentation. So it's worth explaining the Russia effect because it's come up twice now. It's come up in last year's iteration and this year's iteration. Um, and so this is where there's a lot of internal debate uh, within the Institute, within the China Institute, but as well as, you know, in popular sort of discourse. Um, because is this a fad? Are citizens actually just saying, hey, Russia is, is standing up to the United States, is standing up to Western jurisdictions, and, and this is and, and this sort of championing of of of, of being anti-West and that sort of rhetoric is 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 is, is um permeating within the zeitgeist of the Chinese. Um so you know, instead of uh, you know trying to theorize from that standpoint, I try to figure out what the data tells us. Um and so you know, it is plausible that citizens' perception of Russia are potentially influenced by a preference orientation that's elastic and malleable. But here's where we can start getting some data here that, that tells us, gives us some insights. Chinese citizens' self-reported knowledge of Russia has a significant impact on their trust in Russia. In addition, those that receive more of their information on global events from television and social media are likely to trust Russia, while those primarily relying on radio are less likely to trust Russia. There's a gender variance as well. Um, we see that females display, displays uh, less trust than males uh, in Russia. Um, of course, other factors such as location, CPC membership, education, does not really seem to statistically significantly impact response propensity to trust Russia. Um, but differently, it's a mixed bag. Uh, what makes the survey interesting and perhaps frustrating is that um, it's not only giving you your, your, your standardized sort of urban eastern seaboard sort of perception, i.e. the elite perception, relatively speaking. It's giving you a perception of how, how Chinese truly see the world um, from, from, a, from a representative standpoint, i.e. the rural populations, the, um, the hidden populations, the, the western seaboard or the western uh, sort of provinces. And so perhaps here... Uh, we see uh, why Russia is seen in such good light um, in many respects. Um, and so in the report that will be released uh, in, in, at the end of this presentation, we go into great length to try and understand the Russia effect. But these are some of the things that we were examining. So I do invite you to, to read that, that, that appendix that, that talks about the Russia effect. Um, for just because of the sake of time, I, I do need to, to finish very soon. Um, I just want to say a few words about Sino-Taiwan reunification and citizens' perspective there. Um, citizens generally wanted a diplomatic reunification with Taiwan. 68% uh, of response indicated a favorable stance towards a diplomatic solution directly with Taiwan. Now, the caveat is this, is if the United States is involved in a diplomatic reunification with Taiwan, citizens are less su supportive, in fact, dramatically less supportive, 32%, uh, compared to 68% where the U.S. is not involved. Um, Respondents' uh, interest in pursuing a diplomatic solution with Taiwan depended on their education levels and their monthly household income. Now, one of the things that we did is we, we ran the survey, half of the survey at least, before the elections in Taiwan and after the elections in Taiwan. And we were thinking maybe there'd be some variation. Maybe there will be something of analytical interest. There wasn't. Uh, what we saw is that the recent Taiwan elections did not change citizens' um, perception about having a diplomatic reunification with Taiwan instead of a military one, and their perception of having the United States involved, or rather not having the US involved in diplomatic reunification with Taiwan. 
Um, we will we will we will produce a, a, a piece on this very soon. This is only looking at this, so I'm not going to stress too much on this. But I just wanted to give you the top line headlines, looking at citizens' perspective on Sino-Taiwan unification. Um, China's role in global conflict hotspots is something we looked at as well. We looked at the Russia-Ukraine conflict, and we looked at Israel and Palestine. Citizens are relatively ambivalent about the conflict, even as they readily identify Russia as having lost strength during the course of this conflict. Um, there is support for China playing an active role in resolving the conflict, particularly among middle-income and less educated respondents. Um, Respondents who believe that China's interests have been affected by the conflict are more likely to support China playing an active role, which kind of makes sense. Uh, we see China's involvement appears weakest among women, again, a gendered view on the conflict, and those in rural areas were less likely to support any potential Chinese involvement in resolving the conflict. Um, when we look at Israel-Palestine conflict, uh, approximately 47, let's just say half of respondents agree with China having an active role in resolving the conflict. And, and then, shall we say another 40% express a neutral stance. So there's more of an ambivalency here. It's whether they just don't see China playing a major role or they do see China should play a major role. Um, citizens who did indicate a willingness for China to be a global leader in peace and security express a greater interest in China playing an active role in resolving the conflict. Women, again, there's a gender perspective here. And those residing in rural areas were less likely to support any potential Chinese involvement in resolving the conflict. We saw that uh, um, respondents' primary source of information, global affairs, i.e. traditional versus uh, social media, did not have any impact on their perspectives on the issue. Although, uh, statistically speaking, those that relied on social media for information on global affairs were, were slightly more likely to uh, support China having a role in a potential resolution than those who relied on traditional media. So what are some final words here? Well, you know, what the, what the survey, what this report really highlights are respondents' hopes and ambitions for China playing a leading and active role in, in international affairs. Um, and you do see this in so far that the public's desire for China to, to be an active leader in, is, is influenced by their support for the nation increasing military its military strength. Um, despite the ongoing tensions between China and many Western jurisdictions, uh, the Chinese public uh, do not express interest in pursuing decoupling. At the same time, response remains steadfast in the belief that they need to deepen economic and technological ties with Russia, which tells us, at least from the perspective of citizen support, there's going to be some resilience in the sign of Russian bilateral relationship um, uh, driven by sheer strategic interests. And finally, there is room for cultural connections and people-to-people -people ties. We saw that in, in the Canadian case where um, you know, citizens do, do, do desire and express a willingness to have greater cultural connections and people-to-people -people ties. And, and just in general, not only in the Canadian case, but generally, I think we do need to have more of these kinds of connections, particularly in a post-COVID world, um, where for those two or three years, we, we, we had less and less of those connections. Uh, and the more connections, the more people-to-people -people ties, the assumption is it increases trust. If there's greater trust, it increases cooperation. If you increase cooperation, you increase more peace and security in the world. Um, so that's a sort of uh, uh, overview of how China sees the world in 2024. Um, thank you for allowing me to say a few words, and I guess we'll turn it over now to Philippe and uh, Q&As. Reza, thank you so much. Uh, that's a very rich uh, tour d'horizon uh, overview, uh, and uh, I think it's it's easy for everyone to see how uh, there's a lot of data there that uh, we can continue to unpack. And 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 I think we're going to be, if I'm not mistaken, right, Reza, we're, we're actually going to release the actual survey itself right after this webinar. Uh, it's got a lot of rich information. And and I think uh, I would invite anyone uh, interested to take a closer look. And, and that might help uh, even formulate some some further questions that uh, that uh, we'd be we'd be happy to take uh, both you and I over the coming uh, weeks. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I certainly have a wealth of questions, uh, but uh, there's also a couple of good questions that have come in uh, from uh, from from the from the audience. So uh, perhaps I can uh, start with a couple of those, and then we can have a little conversation about a couple of items and uh, and see where that leads. So uh, I have a question from uh, Evan Due or Du, uh, who's saying, "Thank you for a very interesting presentation." I would like to know why ASEAN as a bloc or selected individual countries within ASEAN uh, were not part of the survey questionnaire uh, 
given that China's economic relations and engagement with the region is very significant? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so maybe in future iterations, we will have to add them. At this stage, it was just from a methodological standpoint. Uh, we had, um, um, you know, it's it's 33 questions. Uh, and uh, adding more means that we have to reduce uh, it's a simple methodological one. But um, again, it's not satisfactory, I know, to say that, but that's the actual reality of the situation. It will be interesting in, in the future if we can add, um, um, you know, more of the ASEAN tigers, shall we say, into the fold and to analyze that. Um, but at this stage, it's just from a methodological standpoint, we didn't have enough um, bandwidth. Yeah. Um, That's great. And and maybe as a as a as an aside and a bit of a plug for the China Institute and some of the work that you and I are doing together with the with the team, uh, uh, we are uh, preparing uh, to 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 roll out uh, some interesting work that looks at third country positioning vis-a-vis -vis the emerging US China uh, kind of rivalry dynamic. And and uh, certainly from that perspective, uh, we're going to put the Southeast Asia under the microscope. We're also doing uh, some very interesting work more on the economic side, uh, taking a deep dive into the nature of uh, Southeast Asian supply chains and, and how integrated are they really with China? Uh, asking questions such as, uh, is it chimeric, for example, to, to consider that decoupling from China is possible or, or reshoring or French-shoring or what have you? Uh, those those are in those are in their hopper and they're they're being fine tuned. So stay tuned for for work of that nature, uh, Evan. That uh, that addresses that, those questions from a different perspective. Okay, I'll take another question now uh, from uh, uh, from Yan Chuan Liu. Actually, it's great to see Yan Chuan's name here. Uh, when I was consul general in uh, Chongqing many years ago, uh, Yan Chuan was actually uh, a locally engaged staff uh, heading the political section at the UK consulate general in Chongqing. Uh, he's come a long way since then. He's, uh, I believe, now uh, on the verge of obtaining his PhD, uh, and he's working at a sister think tank at UCSD that focuses on 21st century China. So Yan Chuan um, has a, a question that actually echoes something that I was going to hopefully bring up, because I think it's 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 top of mind for many listening to the presentation. And that is that um, how should we think of the relationship between Chinese public opinion and government policy, given the lack of an electoral system? Uh, and he frames it both ways, right? So the second part of his question is uh, perhaps the counterpoint. Uh, to what extent is the policymaking process constrained by public preferences? Mm. Those are two great ways to frame that question. Let me start off by saying in a general sense. We've known for the longest time in the contemporary era that um, one of the main reasons why the CPC has been so resilient is that they do measure public opinion. They understand public moods. They understand what their citizens think. Um, so whether it's a chicken or egg or egg or a chicken, uh, it's a, that's up for debate there. But we do know it plays a preference in terms of policy making insofar that um, they are aware of what the citizens can support. Um, and they're also aware of how they can shape citizen support as well. Um, so there is a strong relationship there. Now, this is where we get nuanced. Um, for the sake of this conversation, um, we can, there's a lot of academic evidence that suggests that um, more and more the how citizens' preferences are um, does influence how the how 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 the government policy is being constructed. So there's a growing evidence to suggest that in many respects. Um, and there's also converse uh, sort of academic uh, sort of work to suggest that they're bad citizens. Insofar, they don't correspond, their, their, their worldview does not correspond to the policies of the state, but they're generally in the minority. Um, so there is a strong relationship there in many respects. But ultimately, the top line sort of reality is the fact that um, this, the, in spite of what we might think stereotypically, the party does need popular legitimacy. They do need support from the citizenry, not only CPC members, not only the 100 million plus CPC members, but they do need the legitimacy of the, of the general public. Um, and that's a, a great truism throughout the contemporary era of why mm -hmm. they've been so resilient. You know, Reza, uh, maybe uh, I'm going to ask a question that touches on, we're getting lots of questions coming in now, which is amazing. Uh, so perhaps I'm going to try to sum summarize two or three of them that are appearing here uh, as follows. Um, you noted uh, that there's a desire that's evident in the survey on the part of Chinese citizens to see China play a greater leadership role in the global stage. Uh, to me, that's very encouraging in the abstract, uh, but... Uh, mm -hmm. 
does that desire lean towards wanting to see a more militaristic, uh, you know, security uh, uh, focus on, uh, with respect to that engagement, or more of a peacekeeping development role, a la, you know, shared community for mankind uh, type of approach, or is it both? Um, and and if you do have a better sense of 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 the data in terms of where the public's inclination lies, uh, what kind of implications does that does that have for Chinese policymakers? So let's start with this simple statement, but it's a very, very nuanced statement. All states are going to act under their self-interest, whether it's China, the United States, Canada. And so insofar that China is going to play a greater role, or the citizens have a preference for China playing a greater role in global governance and in peacekeeping and in, in any sort of leadership roles globally, ultimately, it's going to have to play into the idea that it serves a national interest in, in China. And again, that's a truism in any jurisdiction. So let's not be mistaken about that. Mm -hmm. um, so what we do see is that citizens want China to play a greater an active role from a, from a peace and security standpoint. So that means playing a role in, in, in areas in which China has strategic national interests. This can be in Africa. This can be in the South China Sea. This can be in, 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 in Russia, Ukraine, for example. Um, we do see that citizens are, are, are savvy enough to understand that uh, China does need to increase its global presence in order for it to feed into its national interests, its strategic national interests. Um, and again, that's akin to any jurisdiction. So we shouldn't only pick on China for this, this sort of uh, reality. Okay. Uh, here's another question that I'm going to allow myself the luxury of paraphrasing as moderator because it cuts across. Uh, we're getting, we have like uh, many, many questions coming in now. And that's, uh, you touched on the evolving nature of the sources of information uh, that responses rely on for their understanding of international affairs. Uh, and that clearly, I don't know if you touched on this directly, but when you do read the survey, it's clear that there's a there's a clear trend towards uh, social media, right, as the main, mm -hmm. the main source of information mm -hmm. versus more traditional mm -hmm. media sources. Um, do you have a sense of how that could have an impact on people's views? Uh, and, and, you know, not to get too much into the weeds, but also does it have an impact on, on data collection, you know, as we kind of go year to year, uh, data collection techniques or the type of responses, uh, are they influenced by the medium, uh, that is, that, that, that people draw on, uh, does this pose any new challenges or is any, anything you would like to add or comment? Um, sure. So, I mean, that's a two-parter. So let me ask this, let me respond to the second part about uh, the methodological approach. Um, it's important for us to actually do telephone and online surveys um, because it does uh, give us uh, a different response, mm -hmm. might potentially give us a different response. Um, in terms of whether social media um, makes the public much more malleable, um, it, it certainly it certainly has that potential. Um, what we see in the Chinese context, and this is not necessarily reflected in the survey, but other research I've done, looking at the ideological con construct of the citizen, it's very, it's it's fluid. It can be influenced quite easily. But again, that's in any jurisdiction. Yes. But it seems to be much more elastic in China. And so traditionally, with traditional media, um, the state can influence that sort of construction, how citizens think a bit more, much more easily. With social media, because there are many different sources, um, and it's being triangulated by your, 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 the opinions you have with your peers, the conversations you have with your peers, triangulated by many different social media sites, triangulated by even Western media sites. Uh, um, it, 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 it can influence you much quicker um, than, say, traditional media can. So in many respects, uh, even though I mean, it can be dangerous insofar that the public can be swayed one way to the other very quickly, but it can also be, uh, if you if you are a Western jurisdiction, you can actually influence China if you are able to permeate the the, the social media, uh, and that's a conversation we normally don't have. We don't talk about how we can actually influence China and Chinese citizens. Uh, social media is perhaps the best avenue to do so, mm. um, and it suggests that uh, you know traditionally it took many years to change the the opinion of say of a Canada or Australia or any jurisdiction's image in a country. Nowadays, it's much easier, much quicker to do so if you are able to tap into the right social media platforms, mm -hmm. which you can do. Um, I know, I know, I know. We tend to believe there are restrictions on this, but there is ways around that that you can um, tap into to actually change public's perceptions. Okay. Well, I mean, my just a, a footnote to that. And certainly, as a as a recently retired Canadian diplomat, there's no doubt that. Uh, I've been part of many efforts to try to uh, get uh, the Canadian story out uh, across Chinese social media. 
uh, it is true that it's worth uh, it's worth the effort, but uh, but I, I would say that it is a fairly it's a fairly well controlled ecosystem, uh, per, perhaps uh, uh, less uh, uh, you know free and open or chaotic uh, or difficult to control than than you might think. But that's a conversation for another time. Uh, I'm actually if, if you're okay with this, Reza, I think we're gonna we're gonna go for an extra five to ten minutes because there's a few sure. more questions, and I'm gonna take the moderator's privilege as well to. Um, to just maybe add another uh, couple of thoughts on on the Russia question that you uh, that that you alluded to. Uh, certainly, uh, maybe I, I, allow me to uh, to make a comment uh, that's going to lead to a question, and then and then it's going to be a two prong question. And once I've I've kind of gone through that, I think because it's helpful, I think the audience to to hear a different perspective on things. Or uh, it, I have actually a, a a question related to that 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 will follow. So. Um, I'm sorry, I'm very grateful for your attempts to try to to unpack uh, the Russia effect, as you say, and and as you mentioned, uh, we we do have an annex in the in in the survey that that tries to address that. Um, uh, but you know, perhaps not from a kind of social scientist perspective, uh, steeped in the results of the survey, but perhaps more from a kind of like empirical perspective, the one that I that I bring. Uh, uh, certainly, having spent uh, the you know twenty two of the last twenty five years living uh, in China, and having just moved back from China a few months ago, uh, I would venture to say just you know the, the 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 smell test, if you will, for me is that there's perhaps a little bit more uh, skepticism vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia than 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 comes out in the survey. Um, certainly, when it comes to questions like. Uh, where people would like to travel or or, or study, uh, I just don't get the sense that Russia ranks up there with with uh, with you know Canada, U.S., U.K., Australia in terms of a study destination, and yet the data shows that it that that it does right. So uh, uh, you'll have to take my word for it. I, I've spent a lot of time hanging out not just with the princes of China, but also with the paupers. I. I have, a, I think, a fairly kind of granular uh, empirical sense of things. And so it leads me to wonder, you know, what what's what's behind that? I, I do think that Russia is a specific topic there where, uh, first of all, perhaps notions of trust like you were talking about are easier to express at a kind of an international relations perspective than from a personal perspective. So if you ask somebody, uh, do you think that the Chinese government should engage with Russia diplomatically, or do you think that that's a productive relationship? It's easier to say yes to that than say, well, would you like to immigrate to Russia, where where something where you're like, no, no, I don't want to go live there. Right? Uh, but I also wonder, and I know these, these are difficult questions, but um, how much of uh, you know a Chinese style political correctness uh, comes into the equation, right? I mean, these are easy questions mm -hmm. to kind of know. What the zeitgeist is, what the clear kind of government preference is, and you don't if you don't really have a lot of skin in the game, as a, as a survey respondent, it might be easier to to say, yeah, yeah, Russians fine, even though personally you have no desire to go there, as opposed to perhaps other questions where if you had more intensity of feeling, you might actually respond more truthfully, even though it was risky to do so. So I, I do get the sense that there's there's maybe something going on of that nature. Uh, although, as you say, the data doesn't necessarily, even if it, in, in its refined form, point to that. So uh, that, 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 that would just be a, a comment from, from my part. Uh, you, know, you may or may not want to respond to that. Uh, but assuming that there is this positive sentiment towards Russia, uh, does this kind of hamstring the Chinese leadership if it actually wanted to uh, give itself a little bit of distance in the future. Uh, let's say Russia, you know, went on an e increasingly even more egregious path, or, or you know, China's calculus of where its interests really lie would lead it to want to kind of uh, perhaps you know tack a little bit more towards Europe. Uh, as we see, that there's a push and pull there that that's evident even during the um, the, the Macron visit, where uh, the atmospherics are lovely, but uh, Macron is basically signaling very clearly, and this is not being picked up in Chinese media, by the way. That you know Ukraine is an existential issue for Europe, and 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 the fact that China's not is continuing to provide some some substantive help is 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 uh, is noteworthy and may lead to, to to the EU creating more and more distance. So, you know, so there's a question about Russia there, but also maybe even at a at a broader level, there's an interesting kind of dialectic, right, where if the state is actually you know forging a narrative that leads to a new public opinion. 
then when the state actually wants to attack to another in another direction, uh, whether it's on China, uh, on Russia, or on Japan, they may actually be hamstrung by their own previous efforts, right? So uh, it, I know that's a very long question, but I wonder if you have a couple of quick observations on that. So yeah. I actually see a, a slightly different. I see it's a win-win situation for the Chinese, um, even if it, it can use Russia as a bargaining chip in its engagement with Europe. Um, insofar, um, you know, there's a lot of conversations in the EU writ large about de-risking from China. There's a lot of conversations about EV dumping, et cetera, et cetera. And if one of the carrots or sticks, however your, your, your perspective is, is that China can actually have less of an uh, engagement with Russia in, in exchange for um, X, Y, or Z of Chinese demands, this could be a win-win situation for China. On the flip side, um, it makes perfect sense for the Chinese to partner up with, with Russia even more so, because as I said, Western jurisdictions have completely removed itself from Russia. There's a market that needs servicing. It's a, the conflict in a post-conflict area. Um, China would have greater influence on Russia, um, and, and it's a great market. Um, and so it makes perfect sense. So either way you look at it, it can be a bargaining chip for China against the EU and the United States, or um, the other way, it can be a, a situation where China can profit from a post-conflict situation between Ukraine and, and Russia. The calculus, generally speaking, is one of, of, a, of a standstill right now until there's a U.S. elections, until there's an EU elections that's been uh, finalized. So um, China's in a great position strategically in, in, in terms of where it's at, in terms of Russia and how they're yeah. engaging with Russia. I, I would tend to agree. Um, I mean, at the, at the macro level, uh, yeah. China's ambiguous uh, posture allows it to, to play it both ways. Uh, but if it if it's strongly... Certainly through its own efforts, you know, propaganda efforts, kind of strongly conditions its population to have a pro-Russia bias, does that so, constrain its ability to then tack to another direction should the, should the conjuncture change, is I guess what I'm so saying. So citizens' perception is quite fickle. They can be changed quickly. And I think the Chinese state realizes, understands, and they've known that for many years, they are able to change um, that risk elasticity, that's a nice fancy way, that's a nice nice way of saying they can change positions very quickly. So I don't think the state's um, uh, is too worried about citizens solidifying a particular worldview that they can't uh, slowly try to shift. Um, in terms of the data, this is where, you know, it's, it's going to be problematic because the data says one thing, the eye test or the smell test might say something slightly different. Um, but there's many indicators. If you look at tourism stats, for example, tourism has increased in Russia from China. That may be the result of the fact that Russia is one of the official lists where, where, where you can have Chinese tours to Russia. Um, it's, I mean, among young, even before the conflict, if you look at social media data um, amongst you know friends who have that data, they, they also show Russia has been seen among the young as this champion of was standing up to the West. So that narrative of standing up to the West um, we shouldn't underestimate that it holds a lot of res um, residents among the young uh, in China. And because that's how they want China to be perceived as well. So um, there's a lot of mixed messages. I understand that. But we can't ignore the fact that Russia is prominent, uh, irrespective of, of the sort of radiance we're looking at. I agree. And it's it, look, uh, I, I still uh, personally, <laughs> as a non as, as someone who, who perhaps, uh, you know, uh, solipsistically will, will, will tend to, you know, it, take the value of empirical uh, data uh, as being uh, useful as well. Uh, you know, I, I certainly think that there's a little bit of perhaps virtue signaling in some of those answers, but nevertheless, I think it's a wake up call uh, mm -hmm. for the West in terms of realizing that uh, a little bit like in the early days of the uh, Ukraine invasion, I was still in China at the time and it was striking to me how there was an assumption in the early days uh, in North America and Europe that the whole world would rally behind Ukraine, but actually there was a lot of ambivalence uh, outside of, let's say, Western Europe and North America in terms of, in terms of, of how to respond. And so I think it's important to to realize that that th there are some changes afoot that uh, need to be taken into account uh, to challenge some of the assumptions that we have on our international policy making. So uh, so that's uh, that's definitely uh, very important. So uh, there's, uh, let's see, there's a couple more questions here. Uh, how about this one? Uh, a bit, a bit uh, perhaps a bit easier uh, question, Reza, or maybe not actually. Uh, what, 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 are, what are some opportunities for Canadian policymakers that emerge from, from the data that, that, uh, that, that this survey uh, offers us? So there's a few um, sort of things that we can do in Canada. One, we can actually try and change our, well, 
as you mentioned, you've been trying to change the image of Canada and China in a much more positive way, but we can continue those efforts. Citizens are receptive to that. Um, we can't get any worse than where we are now. <laughs> so mm -hmm. from that standpoint, we can uh, improve our sort of public affairs model. Um, but more nuanced, I think there's conversations, there's been a lot of internal conversations in Canada where we tend to believe China has different values and norms than we have. And that's a barrier to cooperation. In fact, what the data shows is that citizens do not believe that, that values and norms are major differences between Canada and China. But differently, there are more commonalities between us. Citizens believe um, um, between Canada and China than differences. That gives us a baseline that there is something in which we can actually cooperate. Um, the Chinese are open to economic cooperation. They're open, open to environmental cooperation. Um, they're open to many modes of cooperation at the global level, which Canada can play an active role. Perhaps the last thing is uh, we've sort of, and this is conversations we've had in the past, uh, where Canada used to be a trust broker between the United States and, 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 and China. Now, a lot of citizens tend to believe that Canada is just a patsy to the United States. And what, and it's basically, I mean, I'm an academic, I could just put it bluntly, I suppose. Um, and, and in many respects, um, Canada has lost that sort of trust broker sort of image. Um, and perhaps, you know, you might want to think internally, do we want to be a, a trust broker between Canada, uh, between the United States and China? That's something that we can strategically think about as well. Mm. Um, and finally, I think, uh, and this is some, a piece that might come out a little later, uh, talking about decoupling or de-risking from China. Canada cannot afford to do so. We are tied to, to China. And we need to realize that we are tied to China for the foreseeable future. And so it's in our interest, despite rhetoric internally, um, to actually engage with China in a much more meaningful way, to develop greater trusting relationships, have those people-to-people -people exchanges, have those cultural exchanges, try to engineer greater cooperation among things that we can agree upon, because we're not going to de-risk and decouple fully from China. Oh, they're here to stay, and we need them. It's, there's no alternatives. There's no substitutes. Love them, love them or fear them, you're going to run into them, right? <laughs> exactly. Okay, look, look uh, maybe three three more questions, uh, and then uh, we can uh, maybe move on. There's, I, I'm very grateful for all this uh, engagement by the audience. Uh, there's someone who, there's a couple questions about Russia again, but I, like, how about, I'm going to just, instead of rehashing what we just talked about, I think the interesting question is, are you able to uh, tabulate the refusal to respond rates uh, when when doing the survey? I guess I guess the subtext here is uh, that perhaps some of the more sophisticated respondents might just figure that the risk is not worth the reward of of answering the phone on on a on a on a survey re related to these questions, and therefore you end up with a with a, a little bit of a skewed uh, response rate. But I'm, I may be paraphrasing here, but. Sure. So yes, definitely. We can actually calculate the response rates. We can calculate the completion rates. Uh, and they're generally high, particularly mm -hmm. for the online ones. Uh, for telephone, is they're significantly slightly well, much lower. Um, it's just the nature of it. But they're all within the range of acceptability, at least from an academic standpoint. Um, so it hasn't been skewed very much. Uh, in other surveys that we've done similar to this, we've run experiments as well. Uh, there's always this idea when you do survey work in China that they're not giving you a true response and they're giving the official line. And among the survey work that you know I've done, uh, and there are many of these, this is my 15th survey now, uh, large surveys. Um, you know, there are ways around in which you can figure out whether citizens are actually giving their true response or not. Um, and so, yeah, we we've calculated those responses, and in, in an academic sort of paper, we would, we would we would showcase that a bit more. But for the sake of this report, we didn't touch too much on it. Might be interesting to do a comparative study of the level of sophistication of uh, of uh, poll respondents uh, across jurisdictions, uh, given mm -hmm, that uh, mm -hmm. given that uh, dexterity uh, in terms of responding to questions might be more of an existential issue in, in certain jurisdictions than in others. But maybe mm -hmm. that's that'd be an interesting paper uh, for somebody <laughs> to write down the road. Uh, okay, uh, a couple last questions. So we have a question. I, I do want to get you know we have a question from New Zealand. So so I, I think that's uh, that's great to know that we have some uh, some uh, listeners from uh, from New Zealand here. So this is Hasith from uh, Auckland University. Uh, wonder if you could provide insights into China's perspective on the Indo-Pacific strategies of other global powers as a function of the results of this survey. So maybe a tough question, but uh, still one. It's uh, definitely a tough. It's something that, um, as, as Philippe mentioned, this is something that the Institute is thinking a bit more deeply about, and we will have much more targeted 
uh, sort of responses in that respect there. Um, in terms of the Indo-Pacific strategy, we have India, uh, we have uh, Australia, um, we have um, Japan, we have a few of the pr key principles there. Um, in terms of India, China relations, it's uh, citizens think very little of India. They don't see it as as, as high in their radar. So um, whether or not that translates to policy in the, in the future, that's another story. Um, in terms of Australia, again, it's uh, not seen with high regard. So given the limited data we have on this, um, and because this was not our, our main intent was to look at the Indo-Pacific strategy, um, you know, it, it's, 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 it doesn't paint a very good picture of what citizens think of those jurisdictions at this stage. They see the United States, Russia as the main players. Um, they see Europe as a main player. But um, again, another thing to think about, and it doesn't discredit the survey per se, but usually there's a, there's a lag between what perceptions are and what the reality is. Um, and so it might take a few years for us to actually see a different crystallization of opinion about um, China's Indo-Pacific uh, sort of uh, allies or partners or, 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 or competitors, um, because it's relatively new in, in, in the sort of media uh, sort of space right now. Okay, so two last questions. Uh, I like, this is from Wei Liu. Uh, I like the point that knowledge will lead to trust and the mm -hmm. Chinese lack knowledge about China. I guess, uh, I think I think that's a typo, but I think it's the Chinese lack knowledge about Canada. So how mm -hmm. do you propose that we uh, do a better job of informing the Chinese population about Canada? I think it also comes back to some of the work we're trying to do modestly here at the Institute, but more broadly, uh, Reza. So it's both ways. Um, it needs to be, in the phrase of Philippe, enlightened engagement. Mm. There needs to be greater engagement between, in a meaningful way, this is where people-to-people -people exchanges matter. There's so many, so it's a multi-tiered strategy, people-to-people -people exchanges. At the government-to-government -government relations, we need to have much more data-driven, evidence-based kinds of policy making, having frank conversations with each other about things, but done in a respectful way. Um, we have shared problems, shared issues between Canada and China. Canada has faced many of the issues that China's faced and vice versa. We can learn from each other. But that that discourse has not necessarily been that that way. It's been one of a, a bi-directional. It's not been bi-directional. It's been monodirectional. And both sides are guilty of that. What I mean by that is this, is that we can learn from each other so much. Hmm. This is not a kumbaya statement, but it's simply to say there's a lot of case studies that we can learn from the Chinese and vice versa. Generally speaking, our engagement, we don't talk about it in those terms. And so from a government to government standpoint, from a people to people sort of standpoint, meaningful engagement is necessary and it generates trust. There's not as many differences between each other as we think there are. And I think once we get rid of that perception that they're, they're different than us, um, I think that that's one of the major hurdles, the barriers that we need to overcome. If you look at our, pop, our popular media in Canada, for example, it, it, if you were to just read our popular media, you would think China's is evil. China's an entity that we can't engage with. Um, and, 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 and that's not the reality. So I think there needs to be an enlightened engagement between both sides. Yeah, well, I think those are inspiring words. And, and enlightened engagement doesn't necessarily mean engagement that's not, uh, you know, steeped in a, a, an awareness of Canadian interests and priorities, right? Mm -hmm. On the contrary. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I think sometimes the, the black and white discourse uh, right now that's found, uh, often found when talking about China, obviates the fact that a better understanding of China can actually lead to a better formulation of policy to advance Canadian interests uh, as opposed to exactly. policy that's uh, fun, uh, uh, based on a, a less <laughs> uh, a wholesome and fulsome understanding of, of China. Okay, so uh, with my apologies to several people who we won't have time to get to, here's the last question, Reza, before we wrap up. Um, what efforts will you be making to publicize this survey? This is from Susan Gregson, a uh, fellow of uh, China Institute. Are you planning uh, an op-ed? Uh, what about contrasting the views of Chinese citizens regarding Canada, which are quite positive, to the more negative views that Canadians currently hold towards China? So that's a great question, Susan. This is something that the Institute and, and myself, and, and I mean, this is an ongoing work. We plan to run these surveys for, for many years, hopefully. and. Uh, I mean, an op-ed, of course, we have the report coming out at the end of this presentation, so you can actually see the raw report. Um, we're going to have the website that has the raw data as well, so anyone can actually utilize it. Um, our, our, our goal is to you know, enlighten the Canadian public and the general public globally about how China sees the world, because we have so little information about how they actually see the world. 
So this could be through media, this can be through you know academic reports, um, policy reports. And this is something that, uh, as, as I mentioned, we're going to have a piece on, on Taiwan, we're going to have a piece on global conflicts, there's going to be a piece on decoupling. Um, so there's many pieces that not only stems from this, but from the work that the Institute's doing in the near future. So it's a constant conversation that we're going to have. This is not a one-off in it by any means. Okay. Well, Reza, look, this is a very rich uh, overview. Uh, I think uh, everyone will agree there's a lot to unpack and, and a lot to reflect on here, uh, especially once the, the, the survey is made uh, is released in, in the next uh, few minutes. Uh, there's some positive points, actually, that flow out of this, uh, and some noteworthy as well. Uh, maybe in closing, just to bring narrow the lens back to Canada as well, uh, I, I really think there's some encouraging data points uh, that are worth highlighting, right? Which is, you know, despite the travails of, of, of the last few years uh, of bilateral relations, Chinese citizens continue to maintain a positive view of Canada. Uh, they see Canada as a desirable destination for travel, for study, and also as a preferred partner for China on the international scene. So, so to me, I think it, it behooves us then to, to leverage that positive Canadian brand uh, in a way, you know, being a bit more creative in terms of finding uh, approaches that Canada uh, can 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 take to exert influence, uh, given the willingness to engage, uh, create more traction for Canadian efforts that are aimed at soliciting China's meaningful participation in global initiatives. Uh, of course, with a focus more on the peace and security side, I, I would say, and and also perhaps as a potential development partner. So uh, I also, you know, as I was watching the survey, a couple of things came to mind as well. I mean, there's many things we could point to, but this kind of uh, declining, there's still this, you know, I'm sure that if, if, if there's an, a, a, an offer letter from Harvard, most uh, university, most uh, Chinese uh, prospective uh, international students would be happy to go there. But, but from a more broader perspective, uh, you know, the desire to go to the United States to study, you can see there's a, the enthusiasm is waning or it's perhaps calibrated by, by, by various uh, factors and, and, and current events. And uh, so there's still a desire to study abroad, but maybe certainly those who are considering North America, there's an opportunity for Canada to double down on, on, on our efforts to attract those students to, to Canadian institutions, uh, given, given that situation. And, um, and the desire to work on environmental issues as well, I think, is one that's very noteworthy. Maybe there's a bit of an afterglow from the the, the co-hosting of the Kunming Montreal Biodiversity Conference. Uh, uh, but you know, uh, these days you want to grab on to anything you can, and certainly, you know, this is an this is an area where a, a more meaningful Chinese participation and engagement with the West can can lead to, you know, uh, is very accretive to to the global commons. So, so certainly something that's also worth uh, paying great attention to. So look, in closing, thank you so much for all your efforts, Reza, and also to uh, my colleagues at the uh, China Institute for all the incredible work that's happened uh, behind the scenes. I think that those who take a look at the survey will see it, it looks really good. The, the, the graphics are, are, are quite compelling. The analytical heft is, 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 is substantive. That requires a, a, lot, of, a lot of work uh, uh, on the part of everyone. So just a big thank you to that. And uh, and I, I hope that we can actually continue building on this work. And I look forward to, you know, I'm not tasking you here, but I hope that you plan on doing a third uh, iteration of this, Reza, and uh, and that'll give us even richer be benchmarks and and allow us perhaps uh, a better footing to identify even uh, even more uh, new and emerging trends uh, that uh, that are important for everyone to to be cognizant of. So. So thank you very much, and uh, and thank and thank you to everyone uh, for taking the time to uh, to join us today. Merci. Yeah.